wanted to provide some follow-up for the video that we did of our Grand Rounds presentation uh, Ishida and I gave last Friday. Uh, I've had the wonderful opportunity to bring back information from my parents' home, which is like all the letters <laughs> that I ever sent them, and uh, it, it, it kind of uh, correct certain impressions that I gave during the talk, one of which was that the initial idea back in 1973 when I was 27 and had this idea of providing five Oberlin students with a winter term experience, that that might have been opposed by the people who were my superiors, my bosses at that time and there might have been pushback. And in fact, what I found is that the, the opposite was the case, that they actually encouraged this and encouraged me to keep doing it in uh, subsequent times. So, um, and it, it, it kind of brings things full circle in the following way that I think a lot of people thinking about the mentor-mentee relationship would would be would be would be aware that there there needs to be consideration of how much intrinsic, innovative creativity the young person has, but also what the mentor uh, you know contributes in terms of enabling, encouraging that that person. Um, and so now we can sort of tell the full story. Do we, either of you have, have thoughts on this? Or? I, I thought it was really cool that um, Dr. Heptenstall encouraged this because I think it's pretty unusual for someone, you're in your PGY one year, right? Yes. It, it yeah. isn't unusual for yes. someone to have students. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I think that's cool and I think yeah. it started something that lasted a long time. Yeah, it la la lasted 46 years and still still going on. So so it is cool. So uh, Amir, you you were shooting video last Friday. So what did you think about the details of, of this uh, 1973 winter term? thing. Oh. It, it seemed like it would have been cool to be I part think so, of it. yeah. I definitely think it would be really cool to be a part of it. Um, I think, like, um, as Ashita was saying, because uh, you were in your PGY1, yeah. um, I feel like it's a really maturing experience for the students, but definitely for yourself, too, I think, in a sure. way. Sure. <laughs> um, you kind of get, like, a perspective on uh, what people now think, like, oh, the other side, like, oh, young and I don't know, something like that, but um, that's me comprehending that right now, but yeah, that's... Uh, that's yeah, that, uh, yeah. well now what, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to change roles here, Ishida's going to go and run the camcorder, and uh, uh, Amir and I are going to talk about this more, so, <coughs> all right, so the... Uh, there was this crucial letter. <laughs> it, it's amazing how many important things are in this one letter. Letter of February 3rd, 1973. Dear folks, thanks for your recent note. There's a great deal of news here. So this would be a long letter. And I talk here in detail about the winter term project. And I was so proud of it that I sent all the relevant um, details like the handouts for the students, the, the plan for the stu students, for e each of the five students, <laughs> all that sort of thing. And even the, the plan for their first two teaching sessions during the winter term. And we even have a feedback questionnaire from one of the students, Greg Allen. And uh, it, he, he gave very detailed feedback, and he was very happy with the, with the experience. But there were aspects of it that I had just completely forgotten. One of the students, what, 
Beth Kramer was fluent in German, and a lot of the important background uh, literature about the area of kidney medicine I was in interested in, which is called acute renal failure, came from the German experience in like the First World War. And so it's all in German. And she, she was able to like translate stuff. I, I never remember that about her. Um, <laughs> and so that, that, that was really cool. And the other thing is, I knew that the students all stayed at our home, at our, you know, apartment. But I forgot that they did chores there. So like they help with, the, they clean, they help with the meal preparation. So actually our life at home was easier rather than harder because we had all these minions, right? We had all these <laughs> students to sort of do stuff for, for us. So I, I, I had completely forgotten about that. So I mean, <clears throat> You might wonder, did I learn any cytology at all during that month? That's what I was supposed to be doing in that part of my PGY1 right. year, was on my cytology rotation. So if <coughs> the students were complete dead weight on us, if they didn't do anything to help us at home, maybe I wouldn't have had any time for anything, right? I was just scrambling to, to, to teach them, but I can imagine that the reason that I actually learned cytology that month too, it was that in, in a certain way that the, the students made things easier for us at home and they made my life more interesting, they gave me more energy yeah. for every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it, it really changes the whole idea. And on the one hand, I'm quite in awe of my 27-year-old self, you know, <laughs> that I was able to do this. But on the other hand, I wonder whether the, the, the instructions for the Oberlin College winter term program could have been detailed and granular enough. So a lot of the stuff I did was because that's what they said the, the host for, for these things should do, you know, to provide a really satisfying uh, kind of uh, um, multifaceted, um, you know, experience, get students to operate on rats and, <laughs> and to go to the library and all this kind of thing. So, so anyway, no, I'm, I'm just very pleased. I think it, it, it kind of adds also to our discussion of, you know, diversity in inclusiveness. So the main technical staff helping us at that time was a woman of color called Doris Day. She, she's named after the actress Doris Day, but she's not, not related to Doris Day. And, and uh, so um, she did a, a, a lot of the work helping me to um, provide these, you know, experiences for the um, Students. So, the students and me represented one kind of, you know, diversity. They they also had uh, interaction with the other faculty and trainees there. But we we were in the heart of one of the worst areas of Baltimore City. With so everything outside the medical center is it, kind of it's a poor black neighborhood. And, and so our, the experience also kind of you know, reflected that. Now my son, who's uh, kind of mentioned here in the letter, also mentions that, that my wife was pregnant and due in, uh, due in July, so he was born that July 4th. And in my working at the hospital, like I was very, uh, you know, motivated to get, get papers published, right, and stuff. And so when when I was supposed to be looking after him, we the lab was on the first floor, and there's a window where you could see the street where there was parking. So I, I would, like, park him in the car, in the 
car seat so I could see him out the window. I'd be operating on rats and stuff in this room 105 while watching him at the same time. It sort of worked. He, he was like like me, a fairly cheerful child and you know, I, yeah, so nothing bad happened. But it is true, it was a very bad neighborhood. We had occasional very uh, troubling things ha happen. I think there was a student who was killed right on the main steps to the l library, you know, like just walking up the steps. And there was a tree planted in that student's honor beside those steps to the library. So you just kind of knew that probably wasn't such a great idea to park, park your car with your child sleeping there, but, you know, anyway, that, that, that was the way things were then. So the other thing is, you know, there were many papers actually that came out of that work, including the work that, that the students did that uh, January. But the cool thing is that the main paper here, <coughs> the, the, the most highly quoted paper, is uh, this one, Medullary Plasma Flow and in Intravascular Leukocyte Accumulation in Acute Renal Failure. So later those cells came to be called selesocytes, or at least some people <laughs> call them selesocytes. And so there were pictures of these cells in these capillaries, including EM pictures. And so the cool thing is that the actual pictures that I sent to the journal, I still have. And I, I guess I must have sent them to my parents, that's why. <laughs> but like, yeah, here, here is that same EM graphic without the labeling. And uh, another cool picture of a lymphocyte adhering to the endothelium <laughs> and stuff like that. And here are a whole set of, of, of inflammatory cells accumulating in uh, uh, vasorecta. Um, so previously it had been thought that this was extramedullary hematopoiesis, that blood cells were actually being produced in the medulla of the kidney. I showed that's not true, that actually the blood flow there is, is increased. So the, the cells that are there, the white cells, are the same as the white cells in the rest of the circulating blood, but as they go through the medullary area of the kidney, there are chemotactic substances that cause them to want to stay there, to adhere, to, to, right, to hang on to you know, the endothelium, so they you know, accumulate there. But they're exactly the same kinds of white cells that you find in the circulating blood. They're not like primitive white cells that they would be if there was actually extramedullary uh, uh, hematopoiesis. So um, anyway, that's all I uh, had to say. Do you do you have anything further in terms of 18-year-old? Uh. Reflections. <laughs> I definitely like, like I said before. I definitely find this uh, maturing experience because um, there are a lot of students that um, I'm in my first year of undergrad. So, um, and I really feel like if this was offered a lot more, like um, in a variety of uh, fields, I really feel like a lot of people would benefit from that. Definitely. So, um, I am. I'm enjoying it. I'm. I'm having fun <laughs> and whatnot. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. And. Uh Thank you for watching. Okay.